morning, everyone. We will call the Committee on Rules and Administration to order. Today is Tuesday, September 13th, 2022, and we have a quorum present. Welcome, members. Uh, thank you for being available for today's hearing. We have two items on today's agenda. The first, a resolution from the Subcommittee on Ethical Conduct, and second, a report from the Working Group with recommendations for some additional changes to the Senate's non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy. The Subcommittee on Ethical Conduct met over several hearings on the complaint filed by seven members of the Senate against Senator Omar Fateh. The Subcommittee has submitted its report to the Rules Committee for adoption as a subcommittee report. We will not take any further action on the subcommittee report after voting on the adoption of the report today. Members, are there any questions or is there any discussion on the adoption of the subcommittee report? Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to indicate to you as the chairman and to the uh, uh, my fellow members of the committee that uh, as one of the complainants in this matter, it would be my intention that I will not be voting on the motion to adopt the resolution. Uh, I just don't feel comfortable in doing that. So I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Senator Osmick, is there anything you wanted to add as the uh, chairman of the committee? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we met a number of different times. Um, I believe that uh, the report stands uh, as a good product, uh, work product from the committee. I would note that part of, there were two primary charges that were, uh, were brought before the committee. One of them was dismissed entirely. The other one was sustained, a portion of it was sustained and that is included in the committee report. So Senator Fateh was found responsible for a breach uh, of Senate ethics and it is indicated in the report. Uh, other than that, Mr. Chair, I will stand for any questions. I thank the members of the committee and staff members for their time, Senator Kiffmeyer, Senator Torres Ray, and Senator Ch uh, Champion. Uh, we enjoyed each other for at least four times during the summer. Uh, and uh, it was an interesting experience being Chair of Ethics. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Senator Osmick moves to adopt the subcommittee report from the Committee on Ethical Conduct regarding the conduct of Senator Omar Fateh. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion prevails. Next on our agenda is the Senate's current non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy and process which was up, updated and adopted by this committee on June 30th, 2022. Following discussion at that hearing, we asked the working group to meet again uh, to see where they could find consensus, bring forward any additional recommendations that would clarify and improve our policy. I received their recommendations on August 18th. And those recommendations are included in a document that you received by email and is also posted publicly on the Senate's hearing calendar. Their recommendations are highlighted within the adopted Minnesota Senate non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy and process. As a reminder, the working group consisted of the following individuals, Senator Kiffmeyer, Senator Dietzik, Senator Coleman, Senator Kunish, Senator Port, Senator Rood, Rachel Applikowski and Carly Moline. The working group was also supported by Carlin Doyle Fontaine from Senate Council and Nicole Miner, our Human Resources Director. I'd like to thank all of them for their continued time and commitment to ensuring that the Senate is a welcoming, respectful, and safe environment for all who work and serve here. Senator Kiffmeyer and Senator Dietzik are the Republican and DFL leads on the working group and are here to present their recommendations and answer any questions that the committee members may have. The policy version being considered for adoption today is dated August 15th, 2022. 
Senator Kiffmeyer and Dietzik, welcome back to our committee. Please walk us through the process of reaching these recommendations and how the changes will impact the Senate's policy moving forward. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, first of all, I want to say a big thank you to Senator Dietzik. Uh, she and I work very closely together as well as with all of the members uh, that were on, as you have mentioned, and every single one of them gave valuable discussions and valuable contributions. It was a very positive meetings, uh, very positive um, work product, I believe, that we've brought forward. So since the last uh, meeting of the Rules Committee, the charge was that if there were more consensus items uh, that we could bring forward, uh, in, and that is what we have done here. So in the report that you have in front of you, there are nine recommendations from the work group that reached consensus. And uh, several of them, you have those in front of you. Um, some of them are technical, some are conforming language. Some of them are clarifying language to make it more clear as to the intention. Uh, some of them uh, such as uh, not being able to make a text complaint. Uh, HR was concerned about that. And the question that we also brought up was the privacy of the complainant, how important it was uh, to also protect their privacy and also to get official records, uh, which will be done um, if it's a phone call, as it does on page 15 and 16, the documentation, uh, once you've heard, whether it's oral or a phone call, things like that, there's always going to be um, receipt and then also a follow-up and documentation. So uh, some of the other um, consensus items here uh, was about language to make clear that contact persons must cooperate in a timely manner with requests under the policy. There are many kinds of uh, circumstances. And so uh, the discussion was to use the word timely uh, and to make sure that after that, um, the complexity of individual situations may may mean sometimes it is shorter and sometimes that is longer. Additional language to clarify a relationship between an employee and a member must be reported regardless of whether the member has oversight over the employee. And it highlights the inherent nature of the power dynamic of Senate members and employees. Uh, they're also a language to make clear. They um, deletes language, by the way, for the Director of Human Resources to gather information from the complainant and accused regarding how they should be resolving the complaint. A lot of discussion about this and decided to delete it because it put both the complainant and the accused uh, in an awkward position as to uh, their own uh, ideas. And a lot of discussion decided that that was not necessary and not helpful. Additional detail regarding the appeal process for an investigation involving an employee complaint uh, and so just additional clarification. Many of these recommendations were additional clarification. And then um, other language in regards to references to you and your conforming change to make the policy language consistent with previous changes adopted to the policy. So some of them are technical, others a little more substantive, but the intention of all of them is to continue to create that respectful atmosphere and um, to make sure that we have a policy in place in, uh, in these situations. I want to mention the charge was to bring consensus items in our report today, which we have done, but also to mention that there have been 18 recommendations before uh, that had to do with reformatting, clarifying basically the same policy, but make it more clear, uh, do some technical revisions. Um, it was important for us uh, that long paragraphs were sometimes hard to read as to the intention, separating them out into bullets, numericals, things like that, made it appear that the policy is longer, more substantive. But in many cases, it was the same policy, just made more clear and laid out in formatting as well more clear. I do want to mention that it is important today to complete so that HR can prepare uh, for training with the incoming post-election uh, members as well as employees, and uh, time is short for them, and they really need to have this be a final document. Oh, Senator Kiffmeyer, you, uh, your mute button went on. 
Thank you. I moved a piece of paper over, and I guess that was all it took to um, mute me. So my apology for that. At any rate, uh, my final comments was the importance of adopting the final report today. This is actually final two. And so uh, we're grateful for that work because I think we picked up some things that were very important. But I think there's a time and place right now that HR really needs to have this be final so they can go ahead and print the booklets, make sure everything's all buttoned up, and that they can prepare for training to this improved um, policy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Dietzik, and, is there anything you would like to add? Um, uh, just that uh, we had really good discussion and I would like to thank staff and I agree with Senator Kipmeyer that the overall goal was to ensure that we have a respectful work environment where people feel uh, welcomed and are comfortable going to HR or their supervisors if they do have concerns. And so that's kind of our overall goal. We had really good discussions. Um, we had some other recommendations that we chose for whatever reason not to include because we, we also didn't want to get the document and tie people's hands so much that it just got so complicated and people would, you know, plays over it and not read it. So I think this is an easier document to read. Um, the formatting is easier, and these changes just are clarifying to make sure that we have the right guidance. So um, thank you to all the committee members. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer, Senator Dietzik, and uh, the other members of the working group. Um, members, we also have uh, Ms. Doyle Fontaine from Senate Council and Ms. Minor, our Human Resources Director that are available. Are there any questions for um, either uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, Senator Dietzik, or Council or Human Resources. Uh, Senator Frentz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I want to start by saying thanks to Senator Kiffmeyer, Senator Dietzik, and all the people who contributed to the work. This is very important, Mr. Chair, and our staff members watching, the ones that exist now and the ones that will be here soon. With that, um, and, and this is not a question directed necessarily to any particular member of the work group, um, I have heard from Senator Newman on these points, so if he wants to jump in, that's fine. But as to the hearing requirement, Mr. Chair, I think at a minimum today, we should ask ourselves some very important questions about that. As many of you know, the investigator's recommendations did not include that, and the investigator went so far as to say this is the only hearing requirement that she had seen in this type of setting. We know the, the right to confront an accused from the criminal setting in the United States um, this is an employment document, and with that, I do have a few questions, uh, Mr. Chair, posed, if I could, to the committee as a whole and anyone that wants to jump in. In no particular order, they are, why do we prefer that over the recommendation of the investigator? What are the potential legal liabilities for the parties or for the Senate as a whole of having the hearing? As many of you know, a hearing creates a written record. Um, can the report generated by that hearing and a written report would be required be subsequently used in part of a court filing uh, will a minnesota senate hearing report in writing then be waved around in a district court in minnesota and if senate staff are compelled by their um, public employer to participate in this hearing and i believe they would be are we going to be giving them the tennyson warning which as many of you you know is basically a government warning that must be given when a, a person's private or confidential information is collected. And then finally, I had some questions about um, the use of a retired judge and giving them the sole power to decide the discipline. Bottom line, I think a better policy would be to go with the investigator's recommendation. But Mr. Chair, I appreciate the latitude here. And I'm putting these questions out for the good of the committee, whether we revisit the hearing requirement or not, I think the people of Minnesota will be glad and our staff will be glad that we talked about it here today. That is my um, way of saying, does anyone want to hop on those grenades for purposes of discussion here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Frentz. And we did have uh, a significant amount of discussion about the hearing process at our last meeting. Um, my understanding is it's, it's an optional process, but um, Mr. Bodern, could you potentially walk through how that hearing process might work? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I can certainly give you an overview of that. Um, it's uh, Ms. Fontaine, Ms. Doyle Fontaine may have something to add to it as well, having been immersed in this a little more recently um, than me. But 
under the policy, um, I, either the complainant uh, or the person accused has the option to elect uh, a hearing. Um, the hearing is patterned after um, Chapter 14 in the Administrative uh, Procedures Act uh, in Minnesota statutes. It's the policy makes clear that uh, that that process must be used with the modifications provided in the policy. There are 10 days provided for the Director of Human Resources working with Senate Council to obtain the services of a retired judge um, to administer the hearing. Um, and it's it works uh, in an abbreviated fashion. It's not um, maybe in all respects what people would consider a trial. Um, I want to be clear about that. It's much more informal. It's like the hearings conducted at the agency level. But certainly there is the opportunity to um, examine witnesses uh, and cross-examine them. Um, and Senator Francis Wright, the, the policy is clear that uh, ultimately the administrative, uh, the retired the retired judge who could well be a retired administrative law judge um, would be the one vested with full authority to make the final determination um, in that proceeding. Is that sufficient in terms of an overview, Mr. Chair? Is there anything else you want to yep. cover? That's sufficient. Uh, Ms. Doyle Fontaine, anything you would like to uh, add as uh, being part of the committee or the working group? I'm sorry. Um, Chair Mueller, I don't have anything to add as far as just, just the process of it. I, I'm not sure if, if all the questions um, that Senator Friends asked specifically were answered, but um, as to the process of how it would work under the policy, Mr. Bodern um, responded sufficiently, in my opinion. Senator Friends. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and thanks everybody. I think what I'm driving at is why are we choosing to require the hearing? Is there a logic that can be shared with the Rules Committee? The two uh, interests are, of course, in the criminal law, you can confront your accuser, but we want to create an environment where our staff can bring complaints forward without intimidation, without you know fear of retribution. And so I'm simply asking this committee, if we're going to adopt that hearings requirement, is there a logic to that preference that someone can share with us here? Senator Kiffmeyer, Senator Dietzik, would you like to weigh in? Senator Kiffmeyer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Lots of discussion about this, Senator Friends, without question. Probably one of the biggest things is to realize the Senate is not like a regular employer. The Senate is a unique area because we have elected officials and we have employees. We have a Senate environment. And so sometimes when people come in with a kind of a background of other kinds of corporate or private nonprofit situations, they've not dealt with elected officials before. And so it is a unique environment. So I think it's really important to set that foundation. But the other thing was um, that the ability for us to have an administrative law judge, this is not a... Um, this is a situation where these judges are very familiar. They do campaign finance, they do administrative law. And so this is a level um, that I think um, they have the skills and the ability to address the issues, but also they are very familiar with the situation of both the Senate, executive branch, other areas like that, for them to have those kinds of qualities that I think are very important in this unique uh, situation of a Senate. The other thing is that uh, prior to a hearing, there are many other steps uh, that um, are given here, the informal resolution process, there are a variety of areas that give many, many opportunities for the uh, complainant and also the accused in this situation uh, to be able to have those areas be discussed and worked through. Uh, this one, though, would be something that before an administrative law judge is that level that again, um, other areas use this kind of a situation. I think it's very appropriate to the Senate as well. Any other questions? Senator Rest, and then we'll go to Senator Marty. Senator Rest. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry, um, Senator Miller, I believe that um, Senator France was ready to respond to um, Senator Kiffmeyer first before I ask my questions, if you don't mind. Yep, no problem. I didn't see his hand. Senator France. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rest. Um, 
Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. I understand part of what you're saying. I still hope that on this hearing, we will address the question of, are we opening civil liability for individual legislators or for the Senate as a whole by creating a written record? And um, just for my own sake, Mr. Chair, I think the smarter path for us would be to not re allow the hearing to be required. I think it intimidates some of the complainants and will create a better atmosphere if we follow the investigator's advice with that. Um, I appreciate the indulgence. I do think we've discussed this and I'll give the floor back to Senator Rest. Senator Rest. Uh, oh, Senator Rest, you went back on mute. I apologize. Um, Thank you, Senator Franz. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, uh, I share the concerns and have done so in the past of um, Senator Franz about the hearing process. But it also occurs to me that we have to look at, um, you know, senators can't use this process anyway. So um, that's not an issue. The, um, uh, but I have some questions for um, uh, Ms. Minor about the um, the costs of a hearing, and um, I wonder if she would be ready to uh, respond to my questions. Ms. Minor uh, appears that she's uh, ready and listening, so go ahead, Senator. Okay. Uh, thank you. You know, um, I looked through the policy, and I'm um, apologize for my dog. Um, the policy says. And I'm quoting here because I wanted to be very specific. The director of human resources shall perform the record keeping and other functions assigned to the office of administrative hearings under the appropriate uh, statutes. And I want to know, Ms. Minor, have you done any cost analysis on how much this requirement is going to cost the Senate? And I'll wait for your response. And then I have a few other um, uh, cost issues uh, relative to, is the cost worth um, keeping this policy that has been so specifically rejected by our investigator? So um, what cost analysis have you done? I'm sure that you must be looking at that issue. And um, uh, what's your estimate? Ms. Minor, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, that is a good question. Um, while I can't give you a specific dollar amount, um, I could compare it maybe to my experience with an outside investigator. Um, since I've not been a part of a hearing process, nor has the, the process been used since I've been here, um, I can tell you, depending on the severity of the complaint, the number of witnesses, we could hire an investigator um, on the outside um, that would go anywhere between $175 to $250 an hour. Um, and again, depending on the severity of the complaint, the number of witnesses, and the time that it would take to um, write the report, um, it could be anywhere from $6,000 to $19,000. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman Correct. and members, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that that is uh, very instructive as to uh, whether this kind of uh, hearing process would be effective in, a, in achieving a reasonable and equitable uh, result. Um, the policy also says, this is my second question, um, so I'm uh, kind of shocked by the answer to the first one, but uh, in terms of the cost when we have other alternatives that would not be so costly. Um, the policy says, and I quote again, the Senate shall be responsible for the cost of, reti of retaining a retired judge and other costs related to the conduct of the hearings with the exception of any expert retainer fees. And once again, Ms. Minor, I, I wonder if there's been any, any estimate done um, by you about how much it's going to cost to retrain a retired judge to, um, uh, to preside over this kind of um, process from uh, start to finish. And uh, will there be a retainer for a uh, judge uh, ongoing to deal with these um, uh, potential hearings? So, um, I, I wait your answer to that, Ms. Minor. Ms. Minor. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will uh, defer to Mr. Bonner, if I can, if you can um, assist me with the answer in this question. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Chairman and Senator Rest, um, the language used for the complaint process or for the hearing process rather that requires the retention um, of a retired judge is basically similar to the retention of um, an outside investigator. Uh, what retention refers to is for, for the matter uh, in question and not uh, an outstanding you know, retainer arrangement. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the hourly rate for a retired judge might uh, be a little more than what is typically paid for an outside investigator, but typically it's a similar range of uh, training and experience uh, in terms of experience within the legal community. Um, so again, um, I think the only extra cost besides for the Senate, besides uh, the payment necessary for the judge, uh, the retired judge would be possibly preparation of transcript um, if requested by one of the parties and some procedural items. But I don't think beyond that, the policy is, for example, explicit that the Senate will not pay for the cost of counsel for any of the parties involved. Um, I do want to highlight that the under the existing complaint process, when the hearing is not used, um, Ms. Minor has been referring to the costs that are necessary for the use of an outside investigator. That too is a somewhat expensive process. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, um, and Mr. Bodern. Another question for uh, either Mr. Mr. Bodern or, um, um, but particularly for Ms. Minor or um, as she might think of anyone in her, um, in her position going forward, um, that is uh, the Director of Human Resources, when a uh, request um, that must be honored um, comes up as um, what do you consider the, um, uh, the, the grounds or the reasons or the qualifications um, of a judge to that would be um, uh, selected uh, by, by you or any possible successor uh, in, um, in this hearing? I mean, how are you, how are you gonna tell? What, what are you gonna use? as qualifications for a judge to be um, uh, selected in this very contentious uh, process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Minor, Mr. Bodder. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, when it comes to the retention of someone qualified to administer the hearing process, um, although the policy doesn't explicitly require it, someone who is familiar with the operation of Chapter 14, um, what, you know, would be important to find someone who had administered uh, proceedings under Chapter 14. So procedural knowledge of the framework that's provided in the policy would be first and foremost. Um, some experience with employment litigation would be helpful as well. And often uh, when the Senate is looking for assistance for outside investigators, the, the people who are used for that purpose or who are retained for that purpose have experience working for both employees and employers. Um, in the past, they have experienced as counsel working for those entities. So a balance of experience and knowledge of the procedures under Chapter 14 would be um, important prerequisites for anyone serving in this position. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Bodder. And that, that still doesn't ask, actually answer my question, uh, certainly for an investigator who is not a retired judge, <laughs> um, but a retired judge uh, who is going to preside over um, these proceedings. And, um, and uh, Mr. Bodder, and uh, um, with all due respect, that would not be in your current position. That would not be your decision. That would be the decision, as it says in the document, of the um, uh, Director of Human Resources. I think my questions um, indeed point out the weaknesses in this hearing process. And again, not, not uh, recommended, in fact, uh, the opposite by the uh, investigator that we paid over $100,000 to tell us this is a bad idea. Um, and I hope that um, we, um, uh, we find another way 
to have uh, an equitable result that is not intimidating as a hearing process will be intimidating to um, an employee, as I mentioned to start with, it doesn't apply to the senators. We don't have that process. We have another process. Uh, we have the, the ethics committee. Um, and, um, and we are seeing a report from them today on charges against a, um, a sitting senator. So I, um, I think that there are many, many unanswered questions um, that have not been taken up by um, the Department of um, Re uh, Human Resources or that in my mind were adequately uh, considered by the, um, by the committee. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate the work they've done. I certainly do. Um, but it is incomplete, and we should not be moving forward with this hearing process. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and and members. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm I'm my biggest concern is also about the hearing process, and and Mr. Bottom, you just said something. That I thought the policy did not allow the Senate to cover the costs of of legal counsel for Senate employees. Is that accurate? Mr. Bodder. Mr. Chairman and Senator Marty, yes, I thought I stated it that way. I think the policy says expressly, and I'm looking at um, page 21 of the document you have before you, paragraph four says, legal counsel should not be provided by the Senate for either party to the complaint. And, okay, thank you, Mr. Bodder. Then I guess my question, I'm not sure who it's for, but it relates to the same problem with the hearing. And that is, supposing we have an employee who files a complaint, um, maybe against another staff member or somebody else. Again, they, the hearing process doesn't kick in if it's a senator, I understand. But if it's, um, if it's against another Senate employee or somebody, and the person who was accused of the bad behavior um, requests a hearing and the person who filed the complaint, are they, they're forced into a hearing, who's going to cover their legal costs? How are we covering that if the Senate is explicitly not allowed to cover them? Mr. Bodder. Mr. Chairman and Senator Marty, uh, there is no requirement um, for either party to obtain counsel. And in fact, proceedings under chapter 14, I think it is not, not unheard of, not infrequent for private parties to in effect represent themselves. Administrative law judges are typically used to working with um, parties who may or may not be represented. So um, I'll certainly say it's not required, but um, obviously uh, if, if one of the parties to the complaint wants counsel, um, that's their responsibility. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, no more on that aspect of it, but again, I. I... I wrote a letter to all of you the day after the last of the June hearing, and um, I asked it to be posted today, so I'm, it may have been, but I wanted to say that in that, I really am disturbed by the fact that we went against the strong recommendations of the consultant. Um, and again, we were never able to hear directly from the consultant, and, and as I stated in the letter, I was concerned that even the work group was never able to even talk with her. Um, we're supposed to be making recommendations based, we're supposed to be setting a policy in response to her recommendations, yet nobody's allowed to talk with her about it. And the, the specific thing is when she said, because as far as I know, all I saw was a summary of some of her concerns about the hearing where she said it was intimidating and so on. But um, Senator Kiffmeyer, a few minutes ago, when you were explaining why in response, I think Senator Friends you were explaining why we want to have um, this because we're not the same as any other employer. Well, the consultant was saying it was a bad idea and she pointed out that no other employer she's worked with and it sounded like, again, I, I don't remember exactly the words I saw. It was not her words. It was, I think, the summary of her words. And that is she's never worked with another employer on these policies that's ever adopted this. And Senator Kiffmeyer, you were saying, well, that's because we're different. We're, we're, we have elected officials here. And my understanding from further discussion, I think it was something Senator Rest said, is that it's excluded from being used. The hearing is excluded if there's a senator involved. And in that case, um, 
I don't know why. I mean, I think it raises huge red flags if we're going to go against what every other employer she's worked with, every other employer where they're developing good policies has has no hearing process because she says it's intimidating to the complainants and it doesn't even affect us with that. I don't think it's a good excuse to say, well, because we're different because we have elected officials when it doesn't even apply to the elected officials. But can you comment more on that? Because I, I'm, did you get a chance to talk to a consultant? Because I, I heard from members of the work group that they didn't have a chance to even meet with a consultant. None of the rest of us did. And when she is saying it's the only place that's doing it and she strongly advises against it because it's intimidating, um, I guess I'm wondering why I, I don't get your argument for this. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Marty. So, by the way, before I start, I just want to clarify uh, the cost of the um, investigator who did these uh, recommendations was thirteen thousand, not a hundred thousand. So, if there's any other questions about that, Mr. Bodden can reply to that. But it was thirteen thousand. So, at, in regards to the hearing, Senator Marty. Uh, just to also be clear, the hearing process has not been used before. It's a hearing that we have in our policy. And because senators do not, um, they go to the ethics committee, doesn't change the fact that the Senate is a unique employer. We have many policies and many rules that make us unique because we have staff who go out and do campaigning with their members through a leave of absence, other kinds of methodology. And we've had to cross things that are that are in this kind of, of realm. And so there are several things in this policy that made the Senate function in regards to this policy different than maybe a, an employer might be. But again, these, uh, these were concerns that she brought forward. We took um, all of them, except for this particular one. She also recommended that we take away mention of the employee assistance program. Um, both Senator Dietzig and I felt that this was very important to be included because the EAP is the one place where a complainant or an accused have the ability to get advice, um, to talk over things, to get support, and it will be kept confidential for them. Very important. And this investigator recommended we take that out. We felt that was a very, very important part. It's a unique benefit uh, to us. Well, there are other companies that also have employee assistance programs, but especially here in the Senate, and her recommendation was to take that out. We also did not take that recommendation. We did listen to her comments about it and we wrote it a little differently, made more clarifications, uh, formatted it in such a way to address things. But her recommendation was to take it out and we did not do that. We felt in the best interests of our employees. And so on the hearing as well, uh, the consideration that I had brought forward um, was for uh, our employees and to be able to have this as a opportunity for them to be in this situation and to have the hearing process. So I think that is what I have to offer for you today, uh, Senator Marty. I know that's not going to convince you. You're very adamant about how you feel, and I understand that, but I don't see some of the issues. And I think recognizing there are other, the other recommendation of removing the AP was also not taken and we kept it in. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Senator Kefman, I, I understand the employee assistance program when I I was not finding objection to your keeping that in. I have, Again, I'm stuck at the same boat that you and every one of us are, that we haven't had a chance to talk to the consultant. I did not get any sense that that was a huge, strong recommendation. All I heard was to uh, take this out, and I don't even remember what the rationale was for it. And I can understand your decision to keep it in. But with this one, the other one, she gave it, she strongly advised against it, said how it was adversarial, how it would be intimidating to people, all those arguments. And yours as well, we we went against it, but you weren't even able to talk with her. And we haven't been able to hear the arguments. And, and again, when she points out, and I think she used the wording that at least the summary of her concerns were that this is the only employer who would be doing it. And again, I want to stress the fact that um, sexual harassment has the same horrendous impact on a victim 
whether the employer is the Minnesota Senate or 3M. It doesn't matter where the employer is, the victim is the one we're supposed to be concerned about. And when she is strongly recommending that we take this out, and we're going against it, and we're the only employer doing it, saying that the Senate is different, I, I think a lot of people think the Senate shouldn't be treating itself so differently from the public, shouldn't be treating it so different from other businesses. And to me, when a consultant says this, and we're not even allowed to talk with her, we're just going to go against her strong recommendation. I, I don't get it. I think it's really grossly unfair. And that's why I express the strong objections in the letter after that posted and so on. But um, I just am afraid that we are making the process. There are some improvements in this process. I appreciate the work and you and others have done. But to me, this is a huge matter. And it's making a policy not less good than any of the employers that she has worked with, the consultant has worked with. And I think I can say that because that's what we were told exactly that that's what she said. But none of us have had a chance to talk with her and see, well, maybe it wasn't a strong recommendation as you make it sound. Um, maybe it was just a minor thing and we can ignore it. But to me, I understood it was a strong recommendation that we pull it out. And I think we're not going to have a good policy for our employees, the ones we're supposed to be trying to protect here. Senator Lopez Franzen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And I want to express my disappointment in having this hearing continue to be in this in this particular policy. And not to say everything that's already been expressed, but I do uh, want to um, elaborate too. There's questions with this hearing process that um, are not even addressed with the policy as it's written, whether someone can request to be part of this hearing from outside of the Senate could request a hearing to um, deal with this. I wanna take members back to why we're here. And I think we have to remember that, that what prompts us to make changes today um, and I do want to say thank you for the changes that have made the policy better. Uh, but you have heard from our members in our caucus um, because this was uh, an incident um, that involved uh, people and, and, and employees of the Minnesota Senate from the DFL caucus. We are more intimately um, involved and more um, desperately needing this policy to correct any error and any ability for anything like this to ever happen again in the Minnesota Senate. So for, I'm just going to go back to the statement from the Secretary of the Senate, Cal Ludeman, back last year, August of last year, the majority, and, I'm, and I quote, the majority of minority leaders of the Minnesota Senate authorized an independent investigation into claims by a former Senate employee regarding sexual harassment originating outside the Senate. This investigation was not to determine whether sexual harassment occurred, but rather to the extent in which the Senate policy was followed. I continue to quote, the investigation is completed and a report has been received and reviewed by the Senate leadership. While the contents of the report will remain confidential, the report indicated that there was, that there was uncertainty and confusion about the Senate's harassment policy. Therefore, the Senate Secretary of the Senate will recommend a process by which the harassment policy may be amended to ensure its understanding and execution moving forward. So that is the angst that you're hearing from members because this hearing process, um, and I want to also quote uh, part of the report, which was written, and we never had a chance to, to see um, uh, under the decision of the Secretary of the Senate. Part of the investigation, we did pay over $12,000 of taxpayer dollars to make those recommended changes about that particular incident that prompted us to be here today and to work on this for over a year. Um, part of that, this is what the investigator literally said about the investigation and the hearing process. Quote, of the numerous discrimination and harassment policies the investigator has worked with, this is, it, this is the only one that gives parties the right to a hearing in lieu of an investigation. The prospect of a formal hearing would be intimidating and present a significant barrier to those who may otherwise report workplace concerns. Hearings are also costly, time-consuming, and an adversarial process, tending to create more pain than healing. Investigations can better achieve the same degree of impartial fact-finding and appropriate resolution. In this case, 
it would have made little sense to hold a hearing. And that added to the confusion over whether the policy even applied, end quote. So remember, remembering why we're here, taking the advantage of someone who was intimately tasked to go into the details of the incident and having recommendations to improve our workplace and to improve our, our policy, we believe in our caucus that this is an integral part that needs to be eliminated. And, and that is why uh, members, I asked for the A15 amendment to, to be introduced for your, um, uh, entertainment. Uh, it strikes the hearing language and it also um, takes the advice from the expert that was clear as I read to all of you. The hearing process makes it unclear and we can't let this opportunity that we have to fix a wrong and to make sure that every employee that comes into the Minnesota Senate, and mind you, some of these folks are coming straight from college. This is probably their first employment situation because it's an entry into this world um, position and they might not have had any other employment in other places with uh, harassment and non-discrimination policy. So this is their first experience with a policy. And this policy as expressed by the investigator is very different than any other workplace setting. And why is that? Because we're elected officials. It makes no sense that we would have a different policy for a workplace setting. We have to abide by the same standard of any other workplace setting in the state of Minnesota. So members, I ask for your support. And, and I do think that we've made some progress, but this continues to be a very problematic uh, part of the policy, in particular because no one really ha even had a chance to talk to the investigator. And we're left with, is this good enough? And I don't think we can say it is. So members, I, I ask for your support and I stand for questions. Uh, Senator Lopez Franzen moves to amend the Minnesota Senate non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy dated August 15th, 2022 with the A, did you say A15 amendment? A15 and it's posted. The A15 amendment. Discussion on the Can I A15 ask for a roll call, amendment. please? A roll call will be granted. Uh, discussion on the A15 amendment, Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I did put a comment in the um, in the chat. Uh, I just just as an aside before we get to the discussion of this main uh, amendment, uh, that the um, confirmed cost of the investigator in in the in this process of the previous uh, uh, incident was indeed thirteen thousand dollars. That was confirmed. There were other estimates made. Uh, I am concerned. I remain concerned that the cost could of a hearing could be multiples of that thirteen thousand. But I, um, I accept the um, uh, correction uh, in the chat and also um, within this committee by um, by Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and I support the um, motion to amend. Thank you, uh, Senator Marty. Thank you. I also support Senator Lopez Franson's amendment. And I I just want to stress again that I, I think we are acting as if we are special people because we're in the Senate. And I know we're different from other employers, but I, I think that's one of the things that should be offensive to the public and should be offensive to our own employees, that we're going to treat them worse. And again, I as I think Senator Lopez Franson pointed out, one of the reasons we're in this mess was because of confusion about whether the hearing process meant if the individual did not want a hearing process meant that they didn't have one to file a complaint. And so if we're gonna make the policy clear, this seems to be really key if we're gonna address the issue that happened in the past, make sure it doesn't happen again. But again, I wanna quote because the, the, the investigator's reason behind this recommendation to eliminate the hearing process, what the amendment does, is that it would be intimidating and present a quote, significant barrier to those who may otherwise report workplace concerns. And again, that investigator who I believe works in this field, I don't know the person, never talked to them, not supposed to talk to them under this, um, but that investigator said this is the only one of numerous discrimination harassment policies that she's worked with, the only one that gives parties a right to a hearing in lieu of an investigation. And I, I think when we are gonna step against the strong recommendations of somebody we hired to make recommendations on this, 
and saying we're an outlying institution, the only one that does it. And then Senator Giffmeyer is saying, well, it's because we got elected officials here. But as others have pointed out, it doesn't even cover it when it's a senator involved. So I strongly support the Lopez Franzen amendment and hope this time we can get it through. Further discussion on the amendment, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to clarify my remarks were that the Senate, the Senate itself, not senators, the Senate itself, uh, because we have elected officials, I did not say that senators were different. But in this policy, as it was before, uh, Senator Rest has commented on that. So I think it's also uh, that the hearing process is a choice, um, and that's important to recognize that. At any rate, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to clarify, I'm being misquoted here as saying senators are different. That is not what I said. I said the Senate, and I think that's a different, it's a different place of employment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, members, we have the A15 amendment in front of us. A roll call vote has been requested. Uh, Ms. Bakke will take the roll. Senator Miller. No. Senator Johnson. Senator Lopez Franzen. Yes. Senator Bach. Senator Frentz. Yes. Senator Limmer. No. Senator Marty. Yes. Senator Newman. No. Senator Osmick. No. Senator Rest. Yes. Senator Weber. No. Senator Johnson. Senator Bach. Okay. So, um, Senator Miller, I'll text you the. Okay, members, there being four no's and five yeses, the amendment is not adopted. Members, any other discussion? Senator Lopez Franzen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do hope that we continue to work on this and that we um, realize that this is a mistake. Um, but with that, I, I do want to clarify that the hearing process is not an option, that once one party accepts to use it, the other party is compelled to be part of it. Thank you. Any other discussion? Senator Marty. Mr. Chair, um, I'm unclear about the other amendments that were proposed, the list of a bunch of other amendments that were put before us this morning. Um, are we adopting them at this point or what's the next step? Uh, yes, Senator Marty, the next step would be to adopt uh, the approval of the Minnesota Senate non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy dated August 15th, 2022. So are, are we are we going to be taking those amendments, Mr. Chair, are we going to be taking those amendments one at a time or how are we doing that? I believe they're all in uh I believe they're all in the policy. So it'll be one vote altogether. Mr. Chairman, excuse me for interrupting, but Interrupt. I think you I think you reported the vote incorrectly. Um, you said four no and five yes, but it was actually um, four yes and five no's. Just just for the record. Yeah, it should have been five no's and four yeses. The That's motion. correct. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you for the correction. If I misstated it, um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Marty. Then if we are not going to take the amendment separately, but just as the whole policy, I had a question, a couple of questions about the texting portion. Um, and, and my understanding of it is that um, that the, the work group decided not to include texting as a method, but I, I like to hear a little bit of the rationale because I think 
a lot of members and staff communicate frequently between each other by text messaging, probably even more often in some cases than email. And I understand the concern about sensitivity of information being poorly accessed. But if if I if a Senate employee decides to contact their senator or somebody else about this by text, that does not count as a as a complaint. But if they do it by email, it is. But I guess I think a lot of people may be concerned if they want something very private like this, that email is a lot less private because uh, other staff and so on often see senator emails. At least that's the case in my office and many others. But um, I guess I'd like to hear some rationale for why we're excluding texting as a way of a written means of complaining about an incident. Ms. Doyle Fontaine, can you maybe talk on this one? Yes, Mr. Chair and members. I think one thing is that uh, in order, it does not say mean that you you can't accept it, a text as as a complaint par partially, and then, but you don't have to. That doesn't have to be a way that you can receive a complaint. Um, and and for example. Um, the HR director, you know, her her number is not necessarily her personal cell phone device is not available. So she it may be that within a caucus, you all have phone numbers. But I don't think that um, Ms. Minor, her cell phone, you know, that she has to make that available for for complaints. And that was part of the issue, um, you know, and also the cell phones are also not uh, Senate property. We we all own our own cell phones and we all don't, we don't have to give out our numbers. That that would also imply that all contact persons would have to supply their, their cell phone numbers. So um, I guess if you did receive something via a text, you could certainly say, um, could you, could you call me? There would be follow-up on that, uh, you know, a rational person or a reasonable contact person, you know, would take the next step. It was just mostly that we want to clarify that the HR director um, and other persons have personal cell phones and, and our cell phone numbers are not um, widely distributed. Therefore, we don't want to make that a way that you have to receive a complaint. Okay, Mr. Chair, that's that's very helpful. And maybe Ms. Minor, who's got her hand up, may also have a comment because I was not suggesting my objection to it isn't that um, that we make everybody's cell phones available to all the staff who might be making complaints, but just that if a staff member contacts, say, their own senator or somebody in, in their caucus who is a person who can receive the complaint, um, if they want to file a complaint that way, it seems to me initially that that's something that I think should be acceptable way of doing it, but not the other way. So you're saying that they could still if if I heard something from a staff member saying by text that they had this incident of harassment or discrimination, um, I could still act on it. You're just saying we're not going to have in the policy that that if somebody texts somebody, they may because um, again, I don't think people should have or want to have Ms. Miner's cell phone number, and, and you can't text most landlines. So, thank you. That's helpful clarification. Ms. Miner, could you comment as well? Ms. Miner. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to again reiterate kind of what Carlin was saying and that um, it's also to protect the confidentiality of the, the complaint. Um, you know, cell phones, not everybody locks their cell phones and they we don't have Senate issued cell phones. They're in their homes that, you know, kids get on them, play games, things like that, or older, older kids. And it again was not necessarily to say, no, don't accept that text but just to discourage it from being the, the first method of choice. My first method of choice will always be to have the person come in and talk to me. Um, so it's again, a, a method of protecting the information of the, um, of the complainant. Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to clarify this from my recollection of the conversation. So, like an LA supervisor might get a text from uh, another LA or you know some other staff member saying, "Hey, I have this issue," and, and explain it to them. That is perfectly fine. But then in the follow-up conversation with HR for 
any of the number of reasons that um, Ms. Minor mentioned that it is preferred that the official complaint be in writing or in in person. And, you know, that could be explained when they meet with Ms. Minor. Is that, that was my recollection. I'll look for Carlin or um, Nicole to clarify that. Mr. Chair and Senator Dietzik, that would be one of many ways that uh, a text complaint could be uh, the, the, one of the one of the examples that we we maybe talked about. Now, first of all, between two um, two uh, LAs, th there's no contact person involved. But you're you're saying maybe as a bystander, like if the person went then and said, "Hey, I got this from the other LA," um, you know, it would be up to Nicole then to uh, or HR director to to you know get some documentation to maybe follow up on that, but. You know that the text itself to the other LA is not a complaint because there's no contact person until it gets um, reported to a contact person or to the HR director. I was commenting on, um, sir, Mr. Chair, follow up. As the uh, LA supervisor might get a text at saying, "Hey, I have this issue," and that's perfectly acceptable and fine. And then when they forward that onto and the person onto Ms. Minor, then that's when the official complaint for any number of reasons stated might need to be in um, writing and in person. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Deasick, I, I didn't hear about the uh, LA supervisor, but again, it doesn't prohibit from that starting a complaint for somebody, but it just, we're not requiring that, you know, we're not, we're just not saying that that is, that it's required that that is accepted as, as that, but it could initiate it could initiate, you know, anything could, you know, potentially initiate it, uh, a complaint, but it, we just left it out as this has to be accepted as, as a complaint. But I think, I think in that scenario, if that's the way they communicate and it is something that would fall under the policy, then yes, so they move forward with collecting that proper documentation. Thank you, Mr. Fontaine. Any other questions, members? Ms. Minor, you have your hand up. Is that from before? Okay. All right. Seeing no other discussion, uh, Senator Weber, will you move the approval of the Minnesota Senate non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy dated August 15th, 2022? So moved, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, discussion, Senator Marty? Mr. Chair, just real briefly, I think there are a lot of improvements in the policy. I appreciate that. I appreciate the hard work that's done. I just believe that the hearing thing is is so central to the reason we came here in this process in the first place. We are, and Senator Kiffmeyer, I was not saying it's just the senators, but I think the entire fact that we think our institutions should be so different from the way our employees are treated from the way others are. And when there's something that the consultants who are experts in this field say is intimidating to people who want to file complaints, I, I think it's wrong. So I, I'm voting no, just as a protest, not not to detract from all the good work that's being done by other parts of this, but just to say that I think we can and should do better than this. Okay, on the Weber, a motion to adopt the non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy and process. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. say no. No. The motion prevails. Policy is adopted. Members, I want to thank the non-discrimination and anti-harassment working group for all that you have done and all of you that you've undertaken uh, during the last several months to update our policy. While there are some areas where we are not in total agreement, I believe that the work started in developing a sexual harassment policy in 2017 and has evolved into our current non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy and process sets expectations for our staff and members to work in a safe and respectful manner and provides us with a better understanding and clear direction for handling and investigating complaints that may come forward. Um, Let's see, finally members, I would like to pass one additional motion today that allows our Senate nonpartisan staff to make any technical corrections to this policy, including 
correction of typos, inaccurate numbering, et cetera. Uh, Senator Weber, uh, will you make the motion to instruct Senate nonpartisan staff to make any technical corrections to the Senate's non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy and process dated August 15th, 2022, and have it posted to the Minnesota Senate's website? So move, Mr. Chairman. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion prevails. Miss Miner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Up. Chair. Yes, um, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to the committee for um, getting this passed today so that I can um, start working closely with the, our consultant to get this training, very important training together for the new senators. And then I just wanted to um, circle back on the texting questions. I did make some notes that I will focus on, you know, bringing that together in the training, making that clear for the contacts so they understand um, how it may not be in the policy, but it is a method uh, to begin a complaint. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miner. Members, uh, does anyone else have anything before we adjourn today? Seeing none, this concludes the business before us today. The Committee on Rules and Administration is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon.